Good morning, all. Uh, I think I messed up the music as usual. Uh, that was CCR, um, Bad Moon Rising. Um, I don't know, Lakshman. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know that you're as bearish as I am, but I think it is Bad Moon Rising with with respect to the global economy. So I thought it was appropriate. Yeah. Well, I I certainly like the song. So there, it there nice you go. To hear it. <laughs> so we've got a great room today. Uh, Lakshman has um, agreed to uh, spend an hour with us. Um, he really needs no introduction. He's the co-founder of uh, ECRI, which is uh, one of the, the sort of preeminent uh, uh, economic forecasting firms, great at predicting cycles. Um, Lakshman, it's always I'm reminded of Yogi. But was it Yogi Berra? As I said, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you know we're in the business of uh, investing where. You know, we're paid to make decisions in the face of incomplete information. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, and so, um, you know, you're you're you 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 you've been a real uh, beacon. Um, you know, I, I know uh, you you studied it under um, or work and worked for Jeffrey Moore, who's one of the fathers of uh, business cycle analysis. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, maybe a good place to start. It's just just give just a, a little bit of brief of, about your background, and then we're just going to get into we're going to get into Q and A and have a great conversation. So, Lakshman, just talk just a touch about your background and exactly what ECRI does, please. Yeah, sure. And and I can't resist uh, just kicking off of uh, Jeffrey Moore and 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 this Yogi Berra kind of <laughs> uh, uh, mention that you just did. Dr. Moore, you know, over lunch, uh, he'd give us little nuggets of wisdom up at, when we were up at Columbia and. Uh, he said, you're doing very well as an economic forecaster if you can recognize a recession when it is beginning. And I just want to say, you know, we've we've uh, on occasion been able to, quote unquote, uh, predict recessions. But um, this is from this is the the knowledge from someone who spent his entire life. And as you said, was the father of leading indicators. Um uh, kind of letting us know the lay of the land or reminding us of the lay of the land. So what what we do, um, uh, what ECRI does is, uh, is, you know, we strive to manage exposure to cyclical risk. Um, so that could be on the downside. You said you're bearish. And I think, you know, you know, spoiler alert, so are we. Uh, <laughs> we we've been riding this cycle down. Um, and and uh, we're we're looking for any end in sight, but we don't see it quite yet. Um, and we can get into the details of that. But then also when to embrace risk again, and and certainly that uh, is you know it, it is at a time when it may seem crazy to do so. But looking at forward looking drivers of the cycle, uh, there can be an arc be an argument made to to embrace risk at times when when other people are, are not ready to do that. And so. We take this information about the the ebb and the flow of cycle risk, uh, both for growth and inflation, which we'll get into, um, and we we um, we kind of dovetail that into the decision making processes of um, you know fairly large groups institutions. So this could be a, a really big multinational. Uh, that has exposure to some some version of discretionary spending decisions, and um, it can also be for asset managers uh, who are uh, you know trying to allocate among stocks and bonds and different countries and commodities and real estate and whatnot. Um, and so that is um, basically what we do, and we and we look at uh, a very very sophisticated array of forward looking. Um, cyclical indicators um, to 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 monitor how the risk is evolving. And then circling back to Dr. Moore uh, and, and recognizing where you are in the cycle, we're very focused on what's going on with coincident data. And, and, and just one last comment, I think most people tend to be more um, familiar or, 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 or focused on coincident data, maybe trying to now cast coincident data and, and so on and so forth. That's what I tend to see in the headlines. So that's a good place to start, actually. Um, the difference between coincident and leading indicators, particularly in the 
media world we're now in dominated by, you know, social media. Also that phrase that I can't stand whenever I hear democratization <laughs> to me, that's, that's, it's ba- when I hear that word, I, I want to run as fast as I can away from you know, run, don't walk as fast away from that word democratization. Cause what that usually, what it comes down to mean basically is you have do it. Your home gamers as Jim Cramer would call them. Uh, again, I don't advise anyone following Jim Cramer, but people who really aren't steeped in history or financially illiterate who haven't spent the time, um, you know, taking shortcuts and reaching um, erroneous conclusions. I mean, this is a hard business. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's, it's, it's it can kind of superficially look easy, but it's not. And it's to my way of thinking, in many cases, it's like giving a, a child a loaded gun to play with. So could you talk a little bit about the misuse is, is I, I, I'll just say it. I'll just put it out there. We both agree that excessive focus on coincident indicators. Your thoughts about, um, and again, I'm not asking you to make a market prediction, but the how that's changed over the years, and do you think, in fact, that's leading some people to the wrong investment conclusions? Um, yeah. Uh, I do think that people misjudge the risk of cycle turns um, pretty reliably. Uh, now, now to be clear, uh, I don't, I'm not saying we know everything. <laughs> We've just been studying it for a long time. And, and so we're the third generation of this research, of, of this type of cycle research. And um, we're constantly looking for uh, uh, new insights, uh, new indicators, and, and how things may have evolved as the structure of the economy evolves. And then we're also struck by um, how robust some of the cyclical um, patterns are uh, in, in, even though the structure of the economy does evolve over decades. Um, and you, 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 one of the things that, that like, so let's go kind of post GFC, so post 07, 09 uh, recession, great recession, and pre-COVID. And if you'll recall, there was a lot of uh, there was kind of a many year push of uh, big data, um, and that's still going on. I mean, it's not that it's just the 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 idea that we have more and more we're tracking more and more information, and there's uh, probably tens of millions of time series at this point uh, that you could look at, and and uh, you know to quote another uh, favorite, I think I think it's Mark Twain. You know, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, and. And you can kind of torture the data to say what you want um, and, and make pictures that seem compelling. What we're looking for, of course, is um, something that uh, has some theory behind it, uh, as well as uh, uh, relationships that, that we can observe and track and, and that hold up. And I saw, George, that you had tweeted out a, a few of the slides, uh, some slides you had, you had, you had come across of Eccles, and there's one uh that's in in the in the feed that's called sequential leading indexes and growth rates and and it's a good place to 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 base this question the coincident index on the bottom of that chart uh is a blue line it's the u.s coincident index that's the now cast that's where we are that's the re that's as best as we can understand reality of where we are in the economy right outside your window yeah, um, actually, actually, let me interrupt for one second, yeah. just for, every, for your benefit and everyone's benefit. All those tweets are now up in the nest at the top. So um, they're in there as a thread. So I believe the chart you're referring to is the second one. It says sequential leading indexes, growth rates. And yes, just for the audience's benefit, the bottom line on that chart, you've got like four lines. The bottom one is the U.S. coincident index. So for everyone who's interested, they're in the nest up at the top. Go ahead, Luxman. Yes, and that blue line, that's the coincident index. So these are um, very large um, measures uh, produced by the government, um, and they're capturing output, employment, income, and sales, and they're collected into a an index. There's some statistical issues that we have to deal with in there, but suffice to say that we think we know what we're doing <laughs> on that score. And um, this is a good amalgamation, a good composite of, of what's going on. 
And you could see um, that the shaded areas on this chart um, very closely conform to what you can see with your eyes, which is uh, the highs and the lows in the blue line um, over time, since in this case, 07. Um, although we, we look at cycles uh, going back, in some cases, a couple hundred years, uh, but in terms of coincident data, probably to um, 1904 or five, something like that. Um, and this ebb and flow, this, the, these shaded areas, this is what it's really all about. Um, are we in a downswing in growth, a deceleration in growth, or are we in an upswing in growth, an acceleration in growth? And, and right now, I'm talking about something which is a little different than the headlines. The headlines tend to focus on recession or no recession, right? I mean, recession is certainly dramatic. Uh, uh, it's a more severe downturn where growth actually goes negative and persists negative for, for several quarters, uh, typically. Um, but for markets and for business decision making, I want to know if I'm accelerating or decelerating. Um, that has a lot to do with demand walking through the door. Uh, and that has a lot to do with um, uh, earnings uh, growth. And so as I, if you're either a business manager or an investment manager, you want to know, um, am I accelerating or am I decelerating? And so you can see um, we're decelerating, where we've been decelerating for, for well over a year now. And um, we're getting uh, closer and closer to zero. So it answers the question in terms of the now casting, are we in recession yet? Uh, the answer is no. Um, and the, the, the fundamental reason in there uh, that's holding up that blue line is the continued growth and employment. So even though employment is decelerating, uh, and in fact, and depending on what you look at, maybe even contracting, um, these large aggregate numbers uh, have have managed to keep the coincident data uh, as a group from from slipping negative, and so we don't have the deceleration. The shaded area continues to the downside. It's not by no means over. There's no reacceleration. Okay, that's super clear. Um, but on this question of magnitude, has it slipped into recession? I think the current read is no. Um, but then we get to the indicators on top. So oh, let me finish on now casting. So I think I, I got to step back here, George, for a second. You'll appreciate this because I know you've been looking at cycles for a long time. Um, you, you know, models, econometric, line, linear econometric models have a very tough time with turning points. Uh, they're just if something if something is cyclical which we believe it is, and you could see that by these shaded areas over a long period of time, that it, there's ebb and flow, there's accelerations and decelerations. So if your environment is cyclical and you're using a linear kind of extrapolation to try and anticipate where you're headed, at the cycle turning points, you're going to have big errors in your between your expectations and what actually happens. And, and we see that borne out in tons of academic research. Um, but what that does to the forecasting community at large is, I, th I think they recognize that as everybody's aware of this. And so they say, I, I think the fallback on this, and maybe even the Fed, which we'll get to, uh, is doing the same thing. They're like, okay, since we can't predict it too well, let's now cast as best as we can. So big data could help us with that, right? If we see how many people are in the parking lot at the mall, then we know what's going on, right? And so we try to, essentially what they're trying to do is to now cast really fast. And there have been some improvements on that, right? I, I, I want to acknowledge that. People are now casting um, quicker and better and faster. And that's a good thing. Great. Um, but if you want to anticipate the now cast, uh, you have to look at leading indicators. And those are the green lines above the blue line on the chart. And, and those are meant to capture and to monitor 
the key drivers of the economic cycle. And um, what we have found looking at the U.S. for an incredibly long period of time and a lot of it real time and looking at um, 21 some odd countries around the world is that the drivers of the cyclical turns in market oriented economies are pretty consistent. They're not radically different, even if the structure of the market oriented economy is in fact different. So um, we can have indicators that worked for cycle risk in the post civil war um, US economy work in the um, 21st century uh, South Korean economy. That's how robust they are at cycle turns. So that's pretty darn amazing. I have to tell you that it still gives me shivers when I say that, that it's that robust. So on the turning point call, we have some good information. These short leading index, as it suggests, is you know not that much of a lead. It's a couple of a quarter or two. Weekly leading index is a little bit longer. Long leading index has uh, three some odd, you know, three or so quarter lead at the turning points, the shaded when the shaded area switches from uh, white to dark shading and 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 back. And so that long leading index we look at, and then I'll I'll take a question. The long leading index is our initial look at the risk of a turn developing, and when it turns down. Um, then the so we so immediately with the long leading indicators give us a prior, we develop a prior view based on the long leading index, which then starts to get confirmed by the shorter leading indicators. So our conviction level um, gets quite high, uh, and then of course we wait for it to show up in the now cast or the yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Lock, lock if I'm listening to you talk and you're talking about um, looking for confirmation across different indicators. It's almost like if you're a, a stock analyst technician, you want to see the breadth of the indicators lining up in a certain way. It's the weight of the evidence to uh, borrow the line from Stan Weinstein. Um, it's not just one thing. And so when you get trend uniformity, you get uniformity indicators, that's that's much more informative. Let me ask you, Lakshman. I mean, and I, I listened to you uh, in a couple of your uh, recent um, appearances. You were in, uh, I think, Michael Guyad's lead leg uh, report, uh, um, uh, Twitter space. A great, great, great listen and, and for, for all those who haven't heard it. And you got on to the points, one of my pet peeves about, you know, we're trying to model something, mainly that of human behavior, card psychology, and turn it into like a physics equation. And you know, my, my dad, you know, rest in peace, he was a theater, theoretical mathematician at Princeton. And his, his head always used to explode at looking at the garbage that a lot of um, stuff that passes for wisdom on Wall Street. And so there's always that... There's always that, that disconnect, you know, and I think you spoke about it in one of your prior appearances, you know, if B, then B, if B, then C. It doesn't always necessarily work out that way. And things change over time. Um, and relationships change, correlations change, new factors pop up. So let me ask you the question this way. Um, how have you had to change your game over the last 10, 20 years and, and maybe give an example also, like, look, we all have, listen, you've got a great reputation, but I'm sure you've stubbed your toe a couple of times. Give me an example of something where you got it wrong and what did you learn from that and how did you adopt to that? Right. So on the first, on the first question, um, they don't change much. That, 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 that's actually the indicators, the forward looking drivers of the economy actually don't change that much. Um, that's our, that's our, it's, it's a, it's an important finding, right? That, um, the stability of these relationships, uh, in terms of, uh, this, some of the sequences that I'm showing you on that chart, uh, at cycle turning points, both across time, I'm talking more than a century of data on the U S including a lot of real-time data. Uh, and in terms of space, I'm talking across, you know, a, a couple dozen, we've done more than 21 economies we've looked at globally. So across space and time, this is a very, very um, robust uh, relationship that we're taking advantage of. Now, 
the data buckets that we're looking at uh, are, are, I can share with you, right? So there's government data, which makes up the coincident index entirely, but then uh, there's also some government data that is uh, a resource for us in terms of looking at drivers of the economy, forward-looking stuff. Um, then there, the second kind of group, big group of data I would call is survey data, private survey data. And um, Jeffrey Moore was a big proponent of developing that resource of data um, you know, over half a century ago, right? That we all take for granted now. Um, and that survey data can be, can be quite useful in, in monitoring drivers of the cycle. And then finally, market data. Uh, it does have uh, some predictive value. Um, the stock market itself uh, is what we would uh, uh, label a very short leading indicator um, of cycle turning points. Um, and the difficulty with any one of these individual indicators is they can give you all kinds of false signals or, or misturns or um, their lead profile might be quite erratic uh, so that they're less usable. Um, so, uh, I mean, one example I can give you of an indicator we had to um, let go was in, we, we looked at, uh, you know, we monitor, we tra you, you may not know, but we track something called the uh, industrial materials prices. And we began doing this in the 80s um, uh, for the Journal of Commerce, which was a very big newspaper back in the day, uh, kind of before the Wall Street Journal became hot. And, uh, or even, you know, I mean, not, I guess the Wall Street Journal was hot back then too, but the JOC Journal of Commerce Index was really interesting because it, it tracked real the real economy the movement of stuff and there we're we're quite interested in uh industrial materials prices so that's excluding agriculture excluding primary uh, precious metals and in tracking a good basket of those indicators um we included uh, some things that are tradable uh, that you could speculate in and some things that you can't. Uh, that's part of getting a, a good mix. And in the bucket of things that aren't tradable, uh, one of the price series is um, old corrugated boxes. Um, it's kind of the stuff that would be outside of the grocery store, you know, after they got their delivery and it'd be all bundled up uh, back in the day. And um, that was a very sensitive price. Uh, it, it didn't fluctuate wildly, but the fluctuations were interesting in terms of economic, industrial activity. And then we had mandated um, recycling. So the price actually went negative. We had to replace the series, right? So those kind of things can happen. Um, as economies or, 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 or regulations or whatever evolve that might impact uh, an input. But the idea of a, of a, like a, 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 a very, very sensitive, in this case, uh, paper good price um, or paper source um, is, is still a very, very good um concept and we just had to find another proxy for that now in terms of our track record and kind of like where we gotten it right where we gotten it wrong um i'm defining this very specifically on the issue of cycle risk the cycle turning point um in my experience real time since 1990 we haven't missed a cycle turning point uh, a directional change in the growth uh, uh, of the economy. Uh, before I joined uh, with Dr. Moore, they were wrestling with um, inflation cycles, which is a slightly different thing. And, um, and, and we could talk about the development of those indicators uh, because I think in the 70s and uh, early 80s, it was quite difficult to get a, a, a bead on the cyclical nature of inflation. Um, and then more recently, um, we made a more recently, I mean, in 2011. <laughs> okay, so 
uh, I'm just revealing that I'm a little older here for some of your listeners. But more recently in 2011, um, we made a an outright recession call uh, where we had made a, a growth rate cycle or a deceleration call. So we got the directional call on, on growth correct. But then we went further and we made a magnitude call where we said, no, the growth isn't just decelerating. It's going to go negative. Uh, and in that instance, the magnitude call was wrong. Uh, we did not see um, the economy go into recession. You could see that uh, in the coincident index chart. It decelerated. That, that has a lot of revisions in it now. Um, but at the time, uh, uh, the data was, was quite weak. GDP growth, which is one of the, it's an output measure, it goes into the coincident index, um, barely, I mean, by a hair, well, uh, I think it was like around a quarter of a percent, stayed positive for a couple of quarters. Um, but it got down to about a quarter percent growth for a couple of quarters back then, and then reaccelerated. So we did not have an outright recession, in a, in a, and that's part of our track record. Right. So having... So, so. Yeah, so, but, so basically, the, the defense held on the one yard line is what you're saying. It, 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 it bent, but it didn't break. So maybe well, we, we got we the get, vector right. We got the yeah. No, I right. got it. I got it. Got it. So, so let's stay. With, that's actually a good segue into the next question I want to ask you. Let's go to current circumstances. There's so many questions I could ask you, and yeah. um, we've got a lot of smart folks in the room. I don't want to monopolize the yeah. questions. Um, in current circumstances, I guess the two things that are top of mind for me, which I haven't really seen adequately addressed anywhere, one, the inflation call. Um, yep. I heard you speak in other appearances recently where you're like, yeah, okay, inflation's peaking, fine. But so one, speak to the potential trajectory. Your best guess is the potential trajectory of inflation from here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two, um, the economy, like, okay, we're slowing. Um, I think I heard you say we're going to go into a recession, but and, and, you, and you may want to speak to the grass where you point about the, we're in the shaded line and all this sort of stuff. But, but the idea of the depth and duration of any recession we might see in respect to the cyclical indicators you look at, whether it's household balance sheets, inventories, capital spending, et cetera, et cetera. So two questions. One, your thoughts about your trajectory of the inflation and two, yep. your idea of what the uh, depth and duration of any recession might be. Thank you. Okay. So let's finish on growth and then we'll, uh, um, uh, pivot to inflation because <laughs> I know everybody wants to know what's going on with inflation. So if we just finish up on that chart that we were we were referring to earlier, um, look at the, they're not they're primarily directional calls. Um, they have a little bit of magnitude information in them, but uh, uh, it's it's really about the directional call. You can see how in well, I can see how emphatic the downturn is. Um, when I look, for example, at the long leading index, uh, which we're showing in that chart, you see it hasn't been this week except for um, the in the depths of the Great Recession. And um, so, so right there, that that tells you something. Uh, when we when we look at the quality of that decline in the long leading index. I'm looking at what, what I've and I've said this before, it's called the three P's, how pronounced, how pervasive and how persistent is the decline. So you can see persistence and pronounced by looking at the chart. You can't see pervasive, but I can share with you that it is pervasive uh, in terms of the inputs into the index. Um, the majority of them are, are moving it down. Uh, at some point, we're just going to kind of push mathematical kind of extremes here because the growth rate's getting getting quite weak uh, in the long leading index. Um, but in relating it to the Great Recession in that period uh, where the long leading index was even weaker than it is right now, um, I'll, I'll just remind everybody that's in the context of Lehman, the failure of Lehman Brothers. So um, we have not, as far as I know, <laughs> had uh, a credit event just yet. Um, but I could imagine that, and that's pure speculation now, okay? I, I just want to wave a yellow flag. I'm speculating here. I could imagine 
that if there were a, a, a credit event now, that the long leading index uh, could go down further. Um, and so that's speaking a little bit to the characterization of the recession that we expect to unfold uh, in the United States. Uh, an aspect that um, not everybody is, is looking at, uh, I think partly because, you know, we're, we're kind of in the U.S., we're the center of the world. We get kind of focused. It's the major market. Uh, there is no alternative to the U.S. market right now, right? So you have to be invested in it. Um, but I still think it's important to look around the world. And, and, in, and in the slides that you, you, you sent out, um, there's something called the 21 Country Long Leading Index Growth and the World Central Bank Policy Diffusion uh, Index uh, chart. Um, and it's in that nest of, of slides that you sent out. This speaks, George, to, the, to this depth question or length question, right? So it's one thing to call a re to, to say, hey, we're likely in a recession. And if you look at like Powell or Goldman, they're, they're kind of trying to, I, I don't know what they're trying to do, but they're, I've heard them use this word softish, kind of like, hey, if there's a recession, it's not, don't worry about it, it's not that bad. Um, and, and I don't think that they understand or know, or, or most people don't know, what, what this chart implies. And, and so it's important for people to, to consider it. The top line, because uh, it, it speaks to the depth and, and length of the potential, the, 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 the recession we expect in the US. The top line is comprised of all the long leading indexes for all the countries we look at around the world. So that's the US, that's Europe, that's Japan, that's China, right? These big ones. And um, you can see that that forward-looking, not coincident, but forward-looking long leading index on the top is quite weak, right? Um, it's, it's rivaling uh, 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 what its readings during the COVID recession uh, and uh, it's not quite as bad um, as the global financial crisis just yet. Um, at the same time, we've got um, these, and this will segue us later into the inflation talk. We've got the central banks. Um, how many of them around the world are tightening? How many central banks around the world are tightening? That reading that you're seeing there is the highest on record. Uh, we've, we've never had such a pervasive uh, global central bank tightening uh, as we are experiencing now. Um, largely because they all kind of messed up on the inflation upturn in 2020. Um, so here they are playing catch up, or let's just, in plain English, they're stomping on the brakes, right? At a time when the forward drivers of the global economy um, are extremely weak. So the prospect, if you put those two ingredients together, the prospect of a global recession is pretty darn high. And, and now if we come back to the United States and you say, what's the backdrop um, for, the, for the recession in the US that we expect? Um, it, it, you, you begin to describe one where there is no clear locomotive of uh, strength um, somewhere else in the world. Uh, to kind of offset the, 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 the recession at home. That's quite different than the uh, 07, 09 recession. Uh, because back then, um, I, I, you know, people know that the, the generally the Chinese just went kind of, you know, to town on um, debt-fueled growth and really um, uh, supplied a lot of demand to the global economy. Uh, that's not happening today. So then I can I can pivot to inflation, but it, but before we go forward, George, if you if you have any questions, oh that, no, no that's that, that that's great. And let's let's do the inflation mm -hmm. question, and then I think uh, KFAB um, is one sure. of the smartest guys in the room. I'm sure he's 
questions, and okay. we'll get some others up here. But l- let's turn let's turn to the inflation, then we'll open up to questions. Sure. Ahead, so Washington. on inflation, there's a couple of charts I think you threw up. Uh, you see our future inflation gauge. So first and foremost, um, before we get in, even in, in, into the chart, you need to I need to give you a couple of minutes on inflation first. Um, our views on inflation um, were were the, the foundation for them uh, is really in the wake of the stagflation of the 70s. Um, when when my late mentor, uh, Jeffrey Moore, as you said, the father of leading indicators, he recognized then, I'm, look, I'm talking 40 years ago, more, 40, 50, almost 50 years ago, uh, that inflation cycles were different from business cycles. And, and we've been working on and refining forward-looking indicators on the inflation cycle ever since. That's a radically different view of how the world works than the way that models uh, are built, which is nine out of 10 of the, of the, of the, of the forecasting approaches used out there. Um, so the value of, of, of just even understanding the concept that inflation cycles are different than cycles in, in, in growth is um, huge. Um, and, and to put that into more recent uh, 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 events, um, this is pre-COVID. Uh, it, it, in the summer of 16, uh, this is ancient history for everybody listening right now, but it's not that long ago. Uh, Treasury. This is back in the in the in the years in, when Treasury yields were super low, and they were bouncing along multi-year lows. And the future inflation gauge um, had a cyclical upturn, a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent upturn. Um, and we had an, an inflation cycle upturn. The the next big kind of inflation cycle call, which set the table for all the grief we have today. Um, was in the summer of 18, two years later. The Fed was in the middle of a, a, a rate hike cycle. Um, all the bond gurus and kings and queens or whatever were out there pounding the table, uh, not just about 3%, but maybe 4 5 even 6% yields in the offing as the big bond bear market was just absolutely sure to take hold. Now, in contrast, ECRI made an inflation cycle downturn call based on the future inflation gauge um, before yields finally topped out in November of 18. And then uh, stock prices started to plunge. Um, And the Fed, as you'll recall, was hiking rates. Uh, They hiked them in September of 18. They hiked them in December of 18. And then uh, you got the Powell pivot in January of 19. Um, and, and here's the thing. I mean, and, and it's a little bit of a setup for, you know, I know everybody's talking about Powell because of Jackson Hole uh, this weekend. Um, but instead of, of like properly diagnosing, this is, I'm talking about the Fed, diagnosing that it had missed a cyclical downturn in inflation. Um, the Fed's big review of that, what I would call a debacle, right? Um, the, their whole big review and kind of, you know, soul searching concluded that there had been a major structural drop in inflation, which had been highly become highly insensitive to falling jobless rates. And, and this, they called it in their model building like the super flat Phillips curve. And, and that misdiagnosis led them uh, to change its policy framework uh, in 19 or, or so from a preemptive, at least attempting to be preemptive. Remember, policy works with long and variable lags, right? We know, we, we think we know this, and it seems like there's pretty good argument that that's true, the way that, that interest rates propagate slowly through the economy. But but they they changed the, follow, the policy framework from preemptive to reactive, right? And, and that's why we're literally now paying the price. You know, you're paying the price right now in higher whatever in prices for stuff that you're buying, uh, in part because of that bad decision. And as a result, in the current inflation cycle upturn, they're just totally 
totally blind and totally off the mark. Um, a year and a half before the Fed began the current rate hike cycle, a year and a half. I just have to underscore that's an, that's an insanely long amount of time if you're a policymaker. <laughs> we warned that inflation pressures had a cyclical upturn based on the future inflation gauge. That huge run up in that red line, that's a leading indicator of the shaded areas um, of, an, uh, of inflation. The blue shaded areas on that chart are inflation cycle downturns. The white shaded areas or the white areas are inflation cycle upturns. So if you have key indicators of the inflation cycle in a pronounced pervasive and persistent upturn, you're not dealing with transitory inflation by definition. It's a cyclical upturn. It's a persistent upturn uh, in inflation. And now we're dealing with, um, you know, I guess they did a little bit of a mea culpa saying, well, you know, if we knew then that it was going to be persistent, we would have acted sooner. But it was knowable. Um, I think the Fed just forgot about inflation cycles, quite, quite bluntly. Um, so do you think people are like, I think investors, I mean, it's not a market forecast, but do you think, um, this? I mean, it has interplay with your view of economic forecast. Do you think inflation is likely to remain at uncomfortably high levels for a time? Yeah, I think, I, uh, well, okay, so let's look at the data, right? So this chart is uh, a little out of date, but it's it's got the basic picture right, okay? So when I'm looking at this chart, you see the inflation cycle upturn in, in 2020. So let's call it about, you see the huge plunge and then the huge upswing in the future inflation gauge. That upswing from to, to the peak, uh, which, which was in uh, 2021, um, that hit a 33 year high in the future inflation gauge. And subsequently inflation uh, has risen to about a 40 year high. Uh, so directionally nailed it, right? Um, now the future inflation gauge has turned so there's a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent downturn in the future inflation gauge. So directionally, um, I, I, it, it, we're not expecting, um, you know, 50-year highs in inflation, right? It's not, it's not just running away on a cyclical basis here. But, but now we have to switch from the directional call. Yeah, inflation probably peaked. Um, to the magnitude call. So, so we've got the directional peak uh, in hand, right? We have a pronounced pervasive and persistent decline in the future inflation gauge. So now the question is magnitude. And you could see from the chart, again, eyeballing, even though the fig has peaked and, and started to turn down, the magnitude of the decline is, is pretty muted. Um, there is no uh, return to the way it was uh, in sight. And so this, this indicator looks forward two to three quarters, I'd say on inflation. And um, therefore, uh, if, if the premise is the Fed is going to experience some sort of easing in inflation that just lets it relax, um, we don't see that in, in our forward looking data. Uh, anytime soon. Um, what's very interesting uh, to give you something that's not on this picture that I that I think is relevant. Um, Powell has on occasion fancied himself to be like Volcker. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of quotes uh, along those lines, and um, he, in, in terms of his mandates, has been focused on the inflation fighting uh, part of it uh, of late. Um, and, and if you look back, there's a lot of storytelling about Volcker and breaking the inflation of the seventies. And, you know, to be fair, you know, he, there, some of that may be myth. Uh, I think he was obviously trying to break the back of inflation, but I don't, I think he was also, you know, just like Dr. Moore said, it's, it's tough to know, um, exactly where you are in the cycle all the time. You're doing very well if you realize where you are right now. And in the 80s, 
you, you Volcker gen, helps generate a recession, 1980. Uh, and as the recession is taking hold, some of the inflation numbers are coming down. He lets his foot off the gas and the future inflation gauge just took off. It, it went right back up. And then he had to generate the, the 1981, 82 recession, a much longer recession, much more severe recession, a global recession. And that finally, that finally broke the back of, uh, inflation. And so, um, if Powell is wanting to be Volcker, he, he, he understands that moment of maybe pivoting too soon. Um, and so we had written back at the beginning of this year, I think it was 2020 in January of this year that, you know, because they goofed it up on the inflation cycle upturn call in 2020 in the fall of 2020, they were left with, in Jan by January of this year, just a choice of mistakes. They could either let inflation run or they could have a recession. And they've chosen the recession. Um, and then they're hoping to kind of have their cake and eat it too. Maybe, maybe dodge the recession. I don't think that's possible here. Lakshman, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I, uh, we could go on this topic for hours. <laughs> I, I mean, in my two cents, I mean, you know, Powell, the Fed, they love to engage in what we call open mouth operations. Um, they, they talk the talk. They don't walk the walk. My belief is at some point, well, look, I have no idea what they're going to do tomorrow, but I'm less interested in what they're going to do and more interested in the market response function. I, I know we're not, you're, we're not here to talk markets. Yeah. But that's, that's what I do. And I, I, I just, I'm just kind of wondering if, if he, if he tries to soft talk it and engage in open mouth operations, not do anything, that maybe the market's going to call BS on him and he's going to react. We'll see what happens. Anyway, let me, let, let, let's move on. Um, I want to open up, up to questions. We have a great room here. Um, I want to turn it over to KFAB. Uh, anyone who has uh, a question, please raise your hand. We're um, in, 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 no, so let, let's move on. KFAB, the floor is yours. Thanks, George. Hey, Lachman. Um, so my, my question surrounds, I've been zeroing in on, um, the potential for this global recession, a synchronized one, is, is, and I think you've said publicly, we haven't really had one since that 81, 82. Uh, and the way I've kind of conceptualized it is almost, we might be poised for the bizarro version of that, to borrow from the Superman comics, um, like the exact opposite, where, uh, to your point, Volcker kind of went easy and then hit the accelerator again, and the, the, the deeper recession came second. Um, so what, what do you think about the potential for the severe one being first and then kind of a reaction function like the opposite of 80 to 81, 82, and, and how that kind of interplays with the prior supply side inflation shocks that we had kind of after World War II and around the Korean War and how the FIG either did or if you, I don't know if you've back uh, tested things to that point. Um, because I, I get what you're saying that the fig hasn't come down yet, but if we're going to get a severe global recession, one would think that demand destruction would be enough to eventually create, you know, that fig really coming down. So I know that it's unwise to uh, predict the predictors yep. and I've, I haven't fully embraced that over the years and at learning at your feet, but just curious how you think about that, those various yeah. um, things. Interchanging. So, so, one of the things, thank you, uh, I, and, and you, you lead me into a really important conceptual kind of um, way, at least that I think about it. I think at Equity we think about it. So we're tracking cycles. Cycles are looking out a few quarters, maybe a year at best. Um, in, the, in the slide nest, there's an indicator of global industrial growth um, slide. And that global industrial growth long leading index, that's our farthest seeing index. And it's tracking global industrial cycles. So it's not country specific. And it's quite weak. And it's, it's, it's extremely weak. Um, and and, and it's, a, it's one of the only global cycles there is because we're all kind of, you know, sharing different aspects of the manufacturing floor around the world. Um, and... We, so we have, I think we have, I'm pretty sure we have, I think we have, uh, at least as I'm not aware of anyone else who has a better handle on where we are cyclically. But that's only looking out uh, a few quarters. And as you just uh, said absolutely correctly, we don't predict the predictors. So then we go to the structural stuff. 
And, and you're lucky if you can recognize it in the rearview mirror fairly quickly, right? So in the late 90s, um, uh, when everybody was talking of a new era, um, we were uh, able to see um, the, how, how some of the globalization had contributed to um, the, 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 the kind of a benign uh, cyclical inflation drivers. Um, and that's a structural thing that was happening back at the end of the last century, right, when, when that was happening. That's a long time ago. Um, deglobalization has been going on now, um, for many, many years. Uh, you know, it was pre, um, it was before, uh, the 2016, uh, presidential election, uh, deglobalization was going on. It's accelerated. Um, the cold war with China, uh, has, has come onto the stage. Um, so a lot of the structural disinflationary stuff that um, supported some of the policy options we have have been using, either monetary or fiscally, um, those things have shifted, it seems. So they, it feels like they're shifting, right? Um, we can't predict the structural shift. We can kind of, like everybody else, try to try to observe it. But by knowing what's cyclical, we can we can sometimes if we could separate the cycle from the structural, we could see the structural a little clearer. And in that sense, it's it's one of the reasons why at the same time that recession kills inflation. Right. That's about as close. One of the closer things to a truism in economics, recessions kill inflation, the demand destruction. Um, we don't know that structurally all those things are going to go back to the way they were. In fact, it, it, it seems unlikely that they will. So you could have an inflation cycle downturn. Inflation gets killed, quote unquote killed, but does it go down below two again? I'm not sure. Um, one of the things that would argue for lowflation structurally um, is a, is a separate issue from this geopolitical stuff. Um, and, and that would be the long, the observable long-term decline in trend growth, uh, both for the developed world, uh, and the developing world. And, and basically long-term trend growth in GDP is determined by the growth of your working age population, the, your workforce and productivity growth. And both of those, I'm, I'm speaking generally here, um, are, are going down for almost all countries. There are some exceptions. You know, India, for example, might stand out. A few other countries um, where there's potential for productivity growth uh, or the population's a bit younger. Um, but a lot of countries like Europe and the U.S. and Japan and China, boy, oh boy. We don't have those numbers moving in our direction. They're, they're weakening. And so that longer term decline in trend growth uh, may have some lowflation uh, with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you might, if, if, you, if you were a policymaker, you got to think through like, okay, you know, what are we doing with population growth, workforce growth, um, you know, what are the pros and cons on all of that? And then what's, what are we doing with productivity growth? And productivity is super duper hard to predict or measure. So that's a whole nother issue. That's terrific. Th th thanks, KFAB. Thanks, Alex. Let's, let's move along. KFAB, please weigh in. I always love hearing from you, but let's, let's kind of go around the horn a little bit. Let's go to Cantro and then uh, Jackson and then uh, Dave Nikoski. Cantro, good to see you. What's hey, up, George. Hey, Locke. Uh, good, good to meet you. Uh, we've crossed paths. Uh, this is the first time we're actually crossing paths and speaking, so good to meet you. Um, great space so far. Uh, you, you. you said something earlier, which I think was super important, and you know, I'm sure you're getting the question, as many are thinking, you know, the, the idea that it's different this time. So I'm curious to hear your answer, and I think I know what your answer is going to be, but 
you know, how do you think about that? You know, A, is it different this time when you think about the downturn that's ahead of us and past cycles and why we had downturns in the past? Is it different this time? And what, 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 what would change your mind? You know, you have, we, we have, you have long leading indicators. So you kind of think, you know, have, have some idea that some of this is baked in, you know, we're in a tightening cycle. We've had a lot of inflation, you know, what would change your mind or what the, what, what's the risk to that view? So kind of a two-part question, right. but um, again, I think you, you are, you kind of touched on it when you first started the, the session here. And I thought, it, I think it's worth repeating uh, the way you articulated it really well. You know, the, the one that's really, I think the huge Look, the elephant in the room is that they really goofed up on inflation, right? So we've got you, – you've got inflation um, near uh, a 40-year high, and you've got the unemployment rate at a 53-year low. And your mandate is um, employment and inflation, right? That's what the Fed's is. So if they're not going to um, – do anything but be hawkish here, you know, what, 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 especially cause they're not even being preemptive anymore. They're just being reactive. So it's just like the stuff that they see that they are reacting to. They, they kind of have to be, I, I think the thing that's different that that's, I think that it's not that it's different this time. We just haven't seen it for a while that there's inflation and inflation is causing trouble for the reflex that the fed has right the reflex that the fed has and you might argue it goes all the way back to the 87 crash is to um give some easy uh support to financial conditions uh and use the wealth effect to a degree to keep things going and the, the you know the kind of policy of blowing bubbles to kind of keep things going and you can do that stuff until there's inflation and once you get inflation now you you can't do that stuff um i mean it was it wasn't even a year ago maybe when 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 it was mmt talk right and 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 now that's gone away so the i don't think it's different this time i think it's simply cycles of growth and inflation i think in terms of our recent experience, meaning over the last several decades, the thing that's new uh, in that respect is that we've got real inflation. So the Fed can't do what its reflex wants it to do. Um, yeah, I, 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 well, actually, I think, it, I think it's semantic. I think you and Cantor are basically saying the same thing. It's a question of semantics. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's different. It's different relative to the last 40 years, but it's not different in overall economic no, history. And the, I think, big, I think and, and the thing that would change our mind, because I, I just want to answer his question, yeah, the thing... The thing that I'm watching for, right, is our long leading indicators on growth. Do I see, can we see any kind of a bottoming? And, uh, you know, that, it doesn't remove the recession, but at least it's, it, it, it starts to give us some bookend some at, at, the, at the end of it. And the second thing we're watching is to see if that future inflation gauge can get a sharper drop down. It hasn't dropped, right? It's done the technical cyclical turn. But it hasn't really um, kind of given up the ghost and, and gone down, and and that would be a big deal if we saw that. Yeah, so l- just l- 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 yeah, George, back, yeah. Hold on, to can't catch it before you say anything. Yep. Just listening to you talk, actually, it's kind of funny to uh, to steal that line from uh, Ollie and Oliver and and, and uh, Oliver and Hardy. You know, Jerome, mighty, this is a fine mess you made. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so you're telling me there's no sign of any growth to be seen on the horizon. And you're telling me inflation is going to go down a lot more slowly than we're used to in the past. Other than that, everything's fine. Other than that, everything's fine. Right. Yeah. Cantro, sorry for interrupting. Back to you, Cantro. No, no, no. Thanks for that, Locke. That was, uh, that was a great way to articulate it. Um, to, just, to, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, and then I'll turn, turn myself off. Is there anything, Locke, that you're seeing, in, in even in the most granular pieces of the data that you know, are leading in the macro sphere, that are making you pause or even is there anything you're even seeing that suggests, Hey, may growth may turn up in three months. Uh, in three um, months. You know, going, no, go- no. Yep. in three months, the answer is no, no not at all. Um, and it's actually qu- quite remarkable as to how easy it is to say that 
I'm looking at leading indexes well over a dozen for the U.S., different sectors and all these different things, and all of them around the world. And uh, the, the, it's super easy to say no. I think the only way we're going to get um, some upticks uh, in the maybe slightly less negative growth in forward data is simply a function of math. I mean, you know, how low can you go kind of questions, right? So that, that global industrial growth long leading index that is in the nest uh, thing, that's a diffusion index. So the lowest it can go is zero and it's there pretty much. So, um, I mean, on that, that's, that's a weird way of, I'm trying to put lipstick on a pig here, but it's, it's, you know, there, it's, that's pretty bad outlook for that global industrial growth indicator. The best I could say is it's bouncing off of the floor. How long does that lead by? That's, a, Thank you. that's almost a, that's almost a one year lead on actual IP growth. Um, it, it could, it, it's a, va it could, it could, it could be a little longer. It could be a little shorter. Um, it, and therefore, we look at shorter leading indicators like that second, that middle line, the global leading manufacturing index growth, which, by the way, leads the global BMIs. So um, we will we will uh, probably see those continue to weaken. And then, of course, like, look, if you're trading, if you're trading industrial materials uh, prices, um, you could see that's a growth rate at the bottom uh, of, of things like energy primary metals, um, textiles, other building materials. Um, and, and you could see that we've gone from almost 100% uh, growth to the upside uh, in the early part of 21 to um, that, that indicator is going lower. It's below minus 20, I think now. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Cancho. All right, we're going to do Jackson and then Dave Nikoski and then Mark Newman. Jackson, please unmute yourself. Blacksman, so great to have you here. My question revolves around um, the boogeyman in the room, the Fed, and how everyone has became so obsessed with what Powell's going to do. We send him, send out uh, multiple deputies, former Fed governors, Randy Krasner, et cetera, and try to talk this thing down. Everyone, in my opinion, is looking at equities versus the real issues that are at bay. So, I mean, are, do, do you expect Powell to come and hit this hard tomorrow and going into September, or is he going to just keep kicking the can? Oh, uh, he'll probably kick the can. Um, the, on this issue of equities, I want to, uh, it's a really good question, right? So, so uh, equities are going up. Uh, are they sniffing out um, a soft landing kind of thing? And uh, um, first, just the data, forget about our forecast. The, the data is that equities, you know, those are, they are good indicators around cycle turns. Uh, you know, they, 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 they by and large are sensitive to them. There's a couple of times when they never turn down during a recession. Now, just to be clear, we've already had a bear market in equities, right? So they went down 24% and now they're rallying back up. Um, but the, the in 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 uh, 1945 uh, when the when the war ends um, there's a recession uh, the coincident data collectively uh, contracted um, but everybody kind of understood the story behind it right and and equities didn't care and they they kept going up the more interesting one may be the 26 27 1926 1927 recession uh, and of course that's in the midst of the roaring 20s. And equities blew right through that recession. They did not uh, really care about that recession. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we ran into 1929 later on, a couple of years later. Um, so it's, you know, equities are an imperfect uh, indicator, but they're pretty good around cycles. So the question is here, what are they seeing? From what I understand, right, the, the, the equity market uh, come down that we had earlier this year is is kind of related to the move in rates, um, but uh, uh, less so um, about any kind of shift in earnings expectations. But um, 
earnings growth, this demand destruction stuff, right? That's very cyclical stuff. Uh, and and when you uh, there's a couple of charts, I think I think I don't know if George put them up or not, but there's a couple of charts around like uh, maybe they're not there, but there's you you could look at like I don't know like iPhone sales <laughs> revenues or or advertising revenues for for Google or or um, demand for you know you know important in, inputs into things like semiconductor chips. These are all well, very yeah, well, very. Well, actually, I have to, well, actually, I have to interrupt. Give me thirty seconds. I'll have those up in a second. Keep talking. Yep. And these are super cyclical uh, uh, kind of things. And so I don't think the I, I don't know who the you, you don't really know what the market is is doing. You can kind of guess, but. I don't get the sense that the market has kind of digested the downturn um, in earnings growth. And so um, on that score, I think there's, there's quite a bit of vulnerability. And if you, if you couple that with um, maybe inflation isn't falling uh, rapidly yet, uh, because in fact, the recession may not, hasn't begun yet as far as we know. Right. So all of these things, uh, still have to be acknowledged, uh, absorbed. Um, and then when we look at that forward data, when we were talking to Canto and, and earlier long leading indexes, those things being down as much as they are, we, we don't have any, of the, any, any, any even light at the end of the tunnel just yet. So what maybe, you know, when, when I push this, when we're talking with clients, remember a, uh, I'm doing all this with clients and stuff. So when we're talking with clients, the, the, and we get to this point in the discussion. One of the things that comes up is like, what would it take for for the Fed to pivot? How could we get there? And um, in, in kind of dreaming that up, uh, maybe a credit event. You know, if their if their reflex is that they want to pivot, they can't pivot because of inflation. Um, maybe it takes a credit event in order to, to give them a cover to pivot. And so that's one thing, but obviously we're all uh, interested if that happens. Right. Right. Yeah, by, by the way, Lakshman, I, I put up the, uh, your two um, charts, the uh, iPhone sh um, uh, oh. consumption chart. So, so they're in the nest now, if you want to speak to those, they're, they're up there now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, I mean, basically what you could see that as, as you get the iPhone penetration into the market around 2012, the the growth in 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 it regardless of when they are issuing new iPhones you know or upgrading them or whatever uh, the growth in that is 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 closely related to the cycle um, and then uh, I mean I'm not picking on Google but they're big right and 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 so advertising is a, a big thing for them and and um, and uh, you could see that it's starting to to um, conform a bit more to cycles and growth. And so um, I think that downward pressure on earnings is, is something that, that ought to kind of come more into focus in Q3, Q4. Thanks. Great, great question, Jackson. Let's go to Dave Nikoski and then Mark Newman. Dave, good to see you. Good to hear from you. Unmute yourself, please, Dave. Dave Nikoski, we can't hear you. All right, so Dave, while you're trying to fix your mic, maybe you got to go out and come back. And I mean, I think the app's being glitchy. Let's go to Mark Newman, and then we'll go to Dave Nikoski. Mark, are you there? Please unmute yourself, Mark. Hey, George, how you doing? Um, What's up, Mark? Great to hear you, Mark. Um, okay. Big fan for a long yep. time. Uh, really uh, psyched to have you here. It's a really great thing. Um, so I've always sort of said that you know, stagflation, there's no defense from the central bank point of view. And so obviously that's an inflation and growth combo. And I was wondering, gun to your head, pick one, like the greater risk to the economy, the markets and, you know, central bank viability, which do you think um, of those two is the, the greater risk? And then the second part is you mentioned the MMT experiment sort of quietly sort of dying away. And, you know, I've been in, I was in Japan a long time and I see them as the sort of MMT canary in the coal mine. And you had mentioned a little, we, we, we brought up that phrase, I heard it earlier, different this time. And I, I see the bubble, you, you said since 87, which I thought is really interesting. I was looking more like from the tech bubble in 00, real estate credit. And now it's sort of a sovereign 
bubble. Yeah. Right? It's up at the sovereign level. Where does it go from here? So that's sort of a two part question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's a, a big question. I mean, our policy responses to stuff is quite um, questionable <laughs> is what I is what I would say. Um, that's generous. Look, yeah, that's generous. Um, look, in the system we have, right, uh, such as it is um, uh, and the and the Fed uh, which is kind of, we got to deal with them now. Right. And so what, what's a bigger deal for them, inflation or recession? I think they're going to have to fight inflation. Um, if they lose whatever credibility they have, uh, gained on that score, rightly or wrongly, if they, you know, they, they have some credibility around inflation fighting. If they, if they lose that, then that's a lot of trouble given the size of debt uh, out there. Um, the reason the Chinese aren't coming to the rescue is because they can't, right? They already did it, uh, following the financial crisis and they blew, uh, what is, I think the largest debt bubble in history, right? And then we're looking at, um, what's going on in China and that's quite alarming. Okay. I've, I've been alluding a little bit to a credit crisis or a credit event. And um, the stuff over there is 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 kind of eye popping um, as as their home prices are, are, are turning down. And uh, the the. A growth in debt, there was a I gave up. You're reminding me of a presentation I gave. Gosh, it must have been in like 2017 or 18 or something like that. And and. I, I talked about something called the Red Queen effect. And if you'll remember through the looking glass, um, Alice is you know, they're having the conversation with the Red Queen and, and she's like, well, you have to run twice as fast just to stay in place. OK. And when you look at the growth that we've had, uh, economic growth, um, in in developed countries you know you could you could you could say this for the us for europe for for uh china the amount of growth we have is is not that much compared to the amount of debt growth this debt fueled growth it's like you're you're doing orders of magnitude more debt growth in order to get a little bit of economic growth it's a really bad trade uh on a long-term kind of policy uh situation so um, with all the, and especially if inflation starts happening, right? So because you can't service that stuff. So we've got um, a very, very difficult situation. My, you know, guess is that they have to take the recession and squash the demand and try to squeeze the inflation uh, uh, back into the tube if they can. Um, although it, it may not go go back that easily because of all these um, structures, some of the geopolitical structural things we were talking about and plus rent, right? You know, I mean, you guys are all uh, aware of the, of the rent component of inflation and how that's quite sticky and quite high. Well, Lakshmi, <laughs> it's like you're a barrel left. <laughs> I was, I mean, I'm pretty bared up as everybody knows, but just listening to you, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm always trying to argue against myself and try to, you know, prove an all hypothesis. You're not, you're not really helping. In that well, I'm not, I'm not bearish. Look, I'm just like cyclically, I can see the direction from the indicators and, and we will survive. It's been 48 recessions, right? We've, we're still here in the United States. We've had 48 recessions. We're here. Okay. We made it through. And, um, the, the recessions can be cathartic. They can be Darwinian, you know, and, and typically the more vulnerable, uh, among us are the ones who always get crushed and they will again. Um, that's the system we're in. I'm not making any kind of value judgment. It's just, that's the way this is our system. And, and, uh, so the recession is going to hurt the vulnerable. It's going to do a reset. It's going to destroy some demand. Um, and the question is, what do you do about productivity growth and 
your workforce growth longer term? <laughs> That's a big question that nobody. Yeah, yeah, with. But, 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 you know, but, but, yeah, but you know, we have a lot. Actually, we'll, we'll wrap this up shortly. You've been really generous with your time. It's been All fantastic. Right. I don't know if KFAB has another question or not, but I was just going to say, let me throw one question at you. And then maybe KFAB has. I'll give him the last question if he has one. Um, as I listen to you talk, and again, I know you're not in the business of predicting markets, but myself as a market animal, and I'm taking um, your inputs. And it's it's a severe case of confirmation bias because you're telling me what I want to hear. But nevertheless, if I hallucinate a little bit or hypothesize that because I mean, first of all, let's back up. The market wants to have it both ways. Yeah, it wants to believe in this softish landing. It's just not going to happen. You a necessary but not sufficient condition for getting yeah. inflation down is you have to have a recession. And, and, and if you get the recession, good luck with your earnings and good luck with the stock market. But so that's the first problem. But beyond that. Um, going back to the concept of time and duration, and there were a couple of really good threads out recently. I'm going to post one um, uh, about what the cycle might look like. And one fellow, um, uh, absolutely brilliant, his name escapes me, I need some more caffeine, was talking about the possibility, and again, we're spitballing here, that maybe we just get a very shallow but long uh, economics uh, economic recession. Um, but we get a pretty severe profits recession. The idea being that, you know, labor, uh, we, we, the labor situation will not resolve itself um, for all the reasons we know. Uh, you're still going to have a poor, you know, high wage gains because of lower uh, labor participation rate, um, poor productivity. Uh, and given that uh, companies are having a hard time attracting and um, retaining labor, they may be. Uh, less aggressive in shedding labor uh, in this cycle. So maybe you get a situation where, you know, the economy slows a bit. I'm spitballing, I realize. Um, and and I mean, we don't want to jump your indicators, but the way I'm thinking about it as a market animal, maybe we get a slowdown and, you know, there's certain the pricing pressures, but companies, the, the lever they normally pull, which is, you know, layoffs, all that sort of stuff, they're loath to do it. Um, and you're coming from a time when, and maybe without getting any secrets away, you could maybe reflect what you're hearing from your corporate clients. Um, you, what, what really takes the hit are profit margins. And we've had this huge shift in returns from uh, labor to uh, capital uh, in recent decades. And maybe the pendulum swings back the other way. And so maybe that all happens. You get a profits recession with no real recovery and the inability of the Fed to throw more gasoline on the fire or, sponge, or punch the, you know, spike the punch ball. And we get just get in this sort of interminably... Let's not even get too bearish. Let's not even say the market's going to crash. Let's just say the market goes nowhere for a long period of time. And, you know, time often kills – time Time kills more people than price because that's when people just give up. And so on the idea that the market, Mr. Market, will do as is, is, is best as good a job as he can to, you know, inflict as much pain as, as possible on as many people as possible, like that's kind of what I'm thinking about. So, so – Again, it requires conjecture on your part. You may throw it out of court because, you know, it's like, well, you just want to look at the weight of the evidence of your indicators. But the idea that we could be in for a period of you know, muted growth, recession, doesn't have to be severe. If it's severe, then we answer the question. Let's just say it's muted growth, slight recession, margins taken on the chin. There's no upturn, really material upturn. And, 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 and for because of the inflation issue – we they have to be relatively tighter on liquidity provided to the market. That would make for a pretty god awful environment for risk assets. Does that scenario seem totally crazy, half crazy, plausible? Like, how would you react to that sort of scenario? Well, look, it, I, I was saying it's plausible um, because our indicators are primarily directional, right? So you're you're in your scenario, you're allowing for the directional call, and you're saying on the magnitude side, hey, maybe it's not that bad. The thing that argues against a mild recession from our cycle indicators is that global nature of the downturn. Um, we don't see that often, right? So when we do see that, they tend to be associated with more severe recessions uh, in the U.S. So that's as far as I could say from the data I have, the market indicators I have. Now, in terms of company, you know, different company performance, look, the really big ones have so-called market power, 
right? So they may be able to maintain some semblance of of profitability and manage the downturn. Certainly, our clients, which are large, um, are, are are prepared for the for the downturn and have been, um, you know, taking kind of tactical moves to to kind of minimize the impact as much as they can uh, with the weaker demand um, that we're that we're seeing. The other thing I would say from a market perspective, it's not necessarily, it makes sense to me. I, it's not It's not something that we are particularly good at knowing, but it makes sense, is this concept of TNAC. There is no alternative country, right? Where, where do you go uh, if you have an allocation to equities? Um, and, and yeah, things are going to be hitting the fan, uh, if there's a recession, uh, and there's no upturn in sight kind of thing, but what's your alternative? So that T-neck kind of thing. And then the, the thing that certainly suggests volatility, uh, is that when we're, if we're going into recession, which we think we are, if there's a risk that it's more severe, which we think it, there is, uh, then and that's two ifs. So I'm speculating, but based in, it's an informed cyclical speculation. Then the the risk of a credit event goes up, and the credit event can both be kind of a negative, right? You know, you're like, what, did something seize up somewhere, and and how does that affect the plumbing in the markets? And then it may actually be a positive because then it it does it does that free the Fed at least on a on a short term basis. Uh, to do what it wants to do, probably, <laughs> you know, which is pivot. So, so that's the that's the kind of lay of the land, right? Um, as far as I could tell. So I, I lean towards being certainly risk averse, but under certain circumstances, I could see, you know, the Fed kind of give up. Oh, I lack from teasing you now. I feel better now. We're gonna have some massive credit event, which could be so bad. It's just gonna <laughs> blow up. They're gonna have to pivot. Oh, okay, we're good now. <laughs> Boy, you're about you're a barrel last. Oh. <laughs> God Almighty! All right, listen, Blackstone, this has been great. Um, we've been going almost an hour and a half. All right. I um, this has been a fantastic room. I know we've all learned a lot. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think speaking on behalf of friends in the room, this has been absolutely awesome. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've yeah, and, and I hope you'll come back. I always say that we have the best rooms on Twitter. We have the best speakers, the best content. If I'm allowed to say um, the best moderation and certainly the smartest audience. So we, this has really been fantastic. And I want to thank you. And I hope you'll consider back, uh, consider coming back in the future. Yeah. Last thing, it's up on the nest. It's in my Twitter feed. If any of you are interested in, in learning more about um, what ECRI does, uh, the phone number for ECRI is in, is in my Twitter feed. It's also up in the nest. And reach out to, to, to Laxman and see if... Um, you know, see if you can inquire about his services. So, actually, with that, I want to thank you. This has been awesome. And, Great. And best of luck. Wish everyone a good day and take care. See you all. all right. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.